Hey, here we go. Welcome to Star Self and Astrology Unplugged. I'm Rick DeClemente. Good to have you with us tonight to episode 213. And we're going to be talking about a variety of things. And we have a special guest uh, later on that we'll be looking at Liz's chart. Uh, tonight, several things have added up. As you know, when I have guests, it throws things off a little bit and some of my subjects pile up on each other. And I have a list I keep rolling of um, things I would like to talk about in the future. And one of the things that's been on the list for quite a while has been I want to find a good shaman. And I had a shaman lined up and we just kept missing each other. We just kept missing each other. We couldn't get together. So I took that as a sign. And then I'm reading a chart yesterday for a young lady. And she says, oh, I'm a seventh generation shaman. Wow. And I've told you about that, Leslie. And she is awesome. Her name, she's from Pittsburgh. She's wonderful, too. Uh, her name is Deneen Joyner. She'll be joining us next Thursday night is my guest as a shaman and she's written her first book and I'm just got it on my Kindle last night so I want to read that but she is really something they're really intelligent and uh, I, I really you don't mess around with Pisces when you when you get the right Pisces you don't doubt them some Pisces, yeah, you can doubt them because they can be real spaced out but you get one with a right mixture like she is she just tells you what it is intuitively. Just tells you. And you don't doubt her. So, we're going to see what she has to say. Tonight, I want to start off with some incidentals. And then we'll be getting to Liz pretty soon, who volunteered. Um, let's take a look at what the planets are doing right now. And you will notice... These are the planets right now. We've been having this past week. Anybody notice a bunch of moodiness all around them? A bunch of moodiness the past 10 days as the moon has gone through this area? Seven days per quadrant. For about the 10 days, the moon has been out here by itself with all the other planets here. And that's what's caused the moodiness because of the bucket pattern to the moon. The bucket handle being the moon. I noticed for sure about three days ago, things were very, very moody. Uh, notice here, the sun is approaching Neptune in the next six days. So any child born now is going to have extremely powerful intuitive abilities with Venus and the sun and with Neptune all together. We are continuing to have the uh, Saturn square to Uranus that a lot of astrologers are putting a lot of weight on right now. Well, I'm putting a lot of weight, up, I don't mean physical weight, weight upon the planetary value. The weight, in my mind, is on the Eris square Pluto. The Eris square Pluto. The Saturn Uranus, the Saturn Uranus is still very important, but the Eris square Pluto is epical. It's the big one. Now, um, I wanted to talk some tonight about Tiger Woods' chart. I'm going to show more about events and how events happen. I'm real glad at the end of the night we'll get to Liz's chart because the main the mainstay of this show is doing people's charts because that's where you see the magic happen. Uh, I know nothing about Liz, and it's just neat to see how it goes. But uh, after we do... Tiger, we're, 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 before we do Tiger, we're going to take a look at a very important chart, which is the chart of Martin Luther King. And the reason I'm telling you this is because here's Martin Luther King's chart. All right. The reason we're going to do that first is what you're seeing happen with Black Lives Matter is happening for two reasons. One, Eris is becoming very vocal. Eris is becoming very much a part of the collective. And this is why you're hearing this. And you're seeing this quality of, we're not going to take it anymore. 
That's Eris. You can sense it with the Blacks and with the African Americans and with people of all nationalities. People have just had it with all this. Thank God. But you can sense a finality to it. And the reason is not because of the planets. The reason, and with women, yes, definitely, Erica. The reason is because of Eris. Eris is the planet that's just not going to put up with it anymore. And she's starting to become prevalent when, in our psyche. To review what Eris does, Eris can't stand unfairness. She can't stand people uncounted, discounted. She can't stand unjustness. And she's very violent. She doesn't mess around. She's not going to just talk about it. She's talking about it for a while. And this is why you see the negative side is what happened at the Capitol, the negative side of Eris. So anyhow, when we, when we look at um, Martin Luther's chart here in a second, I want you to understand, I've been telling people this for years, and even astrologers don't all believe this. When, yeah, the Dr. Seuss books too, yes. Marcia, true, same thing, same thing. Uh, if you YouTubers are tuning in, we're sending messages to each other, and that's, but you don't get to see them, and that's why uh, you hear me talk about things that seem to come off the wall. They're from messages from each other. If you'd ever like to join us on any Thursday, 8 o'clock Eastern time, live any Thursday, just go to Google and type in Astrology Unplugged, and you'll get the link. You can join us. We only have a limit of a limit of 100 seats, so we got plenty of room for you to join us. If not, these things get recorded and put up on YouTube tonight. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is the leader of a country, the leader of a movement, the leader of a corporation, the leader of a family, when that person's chart gets it, it affects the whole thing. Can you imagine being in an Indian tribe and your, your chief goes off to talk with the other chief? And you're coming back to the tribe and you're looking around at everybody and your chief goes off to the other chief and makes all kind of changes between the two tribes. Of course, it affects you. The same is true of a president. And that's why it's so nuts in 2020. Because Mr. Trump not only represented all of us, he represented the whole world. Mr. Trump's idiotic chart it is so bad. The imperfect storm. So bad. And one of the things that happened to Trump is still going on. Trump's got the sun and moon opposite each other with Neptune square to it. He said Neptune square to the sun and moon. That's major stuff. Your two planets. When he was the leader of this country, he's talking about drinking bleach. That's why. Now, did you notice all of a sudden things are a little bit saner? And not greatly, but they're better. The point is when the leader of a movement, that person's chart represents the whole entity, Ford, his whole industry, the leader of USA Today, whoever that editor is, his chart will affect everybody in that organization, et cetera, et cetera. So when you take a look at Mr. MLK, who appears to be dead, but he's not dead because his spirit lives on. Look at where his son is. We don't know his birth time. Matter of fact, his birth certificate, the, the newspaper said he was born around noon. Okay, which puts the sun at the top of the chart. But everything's right there right now. That's what's going on. Pluto is sitting at 25 right now, right there on his son. And Aries is sitting approximately 25 Aries at a right angle. So all you need to know, you don't even need to look at most of the chart. He does have Venus and Pisces, Moon and Pisces. So that's why he was such a pacifist. His son is opposite Pluto, which is why he had such an impact upon the masses. But the leader's chart is being bombarded now. That means that his spirit is moving now. The spirit that made up Martin Luther King is directly related to the chart you just saw. 
Now, I don't know enough about reincarnational astrology. Say he comes back in another 40 years and his chart is different. I don't know what happens there because it's not my thing. But his chart's going through tremendous change now. And what that means is all the things that he, quote, left behind, he didn't leave behind. He's still there on top of them. What does Pluto do to you? Pluto's very complex. I don't know about you, but I've been impressed and amazed and thoroughly pleased at the lack of volatility of the Blacks and the African Americans. They could have raised some real good hell in the past four or five years. They could have raised some real good hell and burnt some cities down and some networks make it look like they did, but they really didn't. They've really, really behaved and tried to do things the way he wanted things done. Another chart that's great to do for this kind of situation is, uh, is Gandhi's chart. Okay, the point, it's not just that they're not that stupid. It's, it's that they, they, they are collectively feeling the integration of heiress within the black movement. When Eris embodies you, when you embody it, you, how do I say, we're going to get to the day when you see a black and white together and you're not going to go blink, blink. And we certainly are still doing that in a lot of ways. And we certainly back in the 60s, it was like the end of the world when you saw that. So this the success of Black Lives Movement and the success of all this will be directly related to how we all absorb the Pluto vibration. Pluto could care less if you're black or white or purple. It doesn't care about it. It doesn't notice things like that. Pluto wants you to be strong and intimate and not betraying each other. That's what Pluto wants. It wants you to evolve to such a strength that you don't betray one another. It's that simple. And if you don't pick up the strength, if you deny it, if you don't look inside to find that strength, to find that, um, that gusto, to find that uh, temperament, then Pluto will really bring your organization lots and lots of hardship and push it to the edge. So the point is to see Pluto and Eris on MLK's sun right now is no surprise to me at all. And I'll bet you if you sat down with his family and talked about intimate things that have gone on in the family. There have been all kinds of things happening because Pluto has a lot to do with solving things at the, oh, what's the word? Lineage level. Next week, Deneen Joyner is going to join us. and She's an expert about talking about your lineage. She spends a lot of time talking to you. She does readings for people. If you, if you hire her to get a reading, et cetera, et cetera. And in her book, she talks a lot about your lineage. And, and she gets her guidance from her grandmother, her great-grandmother. So she's very much attuned to the lineage that she's a member of. So with Pluto is on MLK's sun right now, it traditionally means that MLK is going to be converted and there will be a death and a rebirth. That's what Pluto does. It's a death and a rebirth. And I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a death to the old memory of MLK and a birth of a new one. You're going to see it happen. You're going to see it happen naturally. And it's going to seem so natural to you that you're going to think it's no big deal. And I'm telling you, it's Pluto. Okay? So this has been around a couple of years. It's got a couple more years to go. It definitely is interpreted as coming into their power. I've been telling so many people through the years Pluto has been so active since 08. When Pluto's on you, it means you're coming into your power. Now, 
you can bat it aside and boy, you're gonna pay the price and you can ignore it. I don't want that big horse. Let me have my pony. You go get the pony or you can accept it. You can accept it. Yes, this is my strength. Yes, this is my courage. And I grab a hold of it and then Pluto will help you. So that's what you're seeing in the BLM. Uh, when you talk about the women's movement and we, when you talk about the um, rise of the divine feminine, you're talking about heiress just coming onto the scene, simple, simple old heiress. Now, let's take a look at what was going on in Mr. Tiger Woods chart in the past couple of weeks. Tiger's chart says, Tiger said he had the, uh, he had the car wreck uh, February 23rd. Okay, here's Tiger's chart. All right. And you'll find out that when you, this is his exact chart. When you find out a chart like this, you'll say, well, I don't see any symbols that makes him one of the greatest golfers ever. Well, I'm telling you, hello to astrology. Astrology is very, very, very difficult to see why this guy was so special, why Babe Ruth's chart was so special, Ty Cobb's chart. It's much deeper than you think. If you think you're just going to look at a chart, aha, great golfer. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to look at a chart and say, oh, my God, he flipped his car over and he died. Where's the planets? No planets. It's really hard to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between what the planets are doing and what you're hoping to see. One of the reasons is there's midpoints. There are fixed stars. There are asteroids. There are many other bodies that are not on the chart. It's one of the reasons. But in Mr. Woods' chart, you will notice I've always sensed with him that he's a very sensitive person. He's a Capricorn. His son is in the fourth house, which is sensitive, but his moon is wrapped around the nadir, 22 degrees, 23 degrees. So Tiger is very, very Cancerian. And that's why you see him when he talks sometimes. He's a little tentative. He's sure not outwardly boastful and loud. He, he's kind of a little shy. And um, especially after all the victories he's had, the talent is there, believe me, the Saturn and Leo, the competitor, etc. But what happened to him during his wreck? Well, you go ahead and you put the other planet on the outside and you dial up February 23rd. All right, there's the chart. So now we're looking at, let me get it on your screen. Okay. Now you're going to see some massive stuff here. The inside chart is his birth chart. It never changes. <clears throat> on the outside, notice his natal Uranus. Notice transiting Uranus. Uranus goes around seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years. 42 years ago, halfway around, Tiger's in his midlife crisis. Uranus got halfway around when his wreck. Uranus was 725. His is 621. So about one degree away. It's not always exact. And Uranus rolls the area of the body between the knee and the foot. I don't know why this works. I guarantee you if his Saturn were more involved, his kneecap would have gotten involved. Saturn rolls the knees. I don't know how in the world this happened. It's like miraculous. But look what happened to Tiger. He had the Uranus opposite Uranus and he had Saturn opposite Saturn. Not, not that close, but close enough. So he's probably started really into the danger zone when Saturn back in December entered zero degrees of, uh, Saturn entered zero degrees or, or one degree 
of Aquarius. So when it started in opposition to Saturn. So he was going into Uranus, opposite Uranus, which is which is halfway through about, it takes seven years to go through the sign. So Uranus is opposite Uranus for about a couple years. And Saturn only lasts two and a half years opposite, but he got them both at the same time. Now, <clears throat> excuse me one second. Okay. When Uranus opposes Uranus, I did a video on YouTube. It's probably one of the most popular ones. Rick DiClemente Uranus Cycles. It's been viewed about 3,000 times. Uranus gets the square to Uranus when you're 21. It gets opposite Uranus when you're 42. It gets a square again when you're 63. And it comes complete when you're 84. Tiger has his Uranus opposite Uranus now. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, let's put Saturn to the side right now. What Uranus is about is, am I living my life the way I want to live it? That's the pure voice inside. Am I living my life as Rick should live it, as Tiger should live it? Now, I don't care how rich he looks or how many palaces he has. That doesn't have anything to do with, is he living the life the way he wants to live it? Maybe he wants to get out of the golf scene and maybe his dad's voice in there won't let him quit. Who knows? Maybe he can get out of it whenever he wants. Maybe his ego won't let him out, whatever. But Uranus trouble is always, it is always because you shove down the real you that wants out. That's what it's about. I warned a woman uh, in my class Several years ago, I warned her about a Uranus time. She was happening. And I was just saying this doesn't mean you're going to have trouble, but you got to nip it in the bud. And what that means is if you're denying yourself, if you're going home and saying, I want to do this, but you shove it down because your husband or you shove it down because your mom, whatever, then you're going to have trouble. And I told her and I forgot about this. Same night that I told her, the night I told her about she stepped on a rock in a parking lot, broke her ankle. She did not break her ankle because she stepped on the rock at the wrong time. She, she broke her ankle because she broke her promise to herself to allow, she broke her thread to her own individual self. That's what broke, then the rock happened to, hap happened to happen. So what I'm telling you is the reason he had his wreck and the reason he survived it, two different things. The reason he had his wreck is because you go back that day, you go back that month before, you interview him closely about what was going on in your life during that time, and you're going to find that he's been pushing himself down. Maybe the real him wants to go be a preacher. Maybe he wants to go be a baseball coach. I mean, I don't know his personal attitude, but I can guarantee you he's shoving something down or he wouldn't have had such a horrific, horrific wreck. All those different bones in his, uh, in his lower leg. We'll get to Saturn in a minute. Now, why did he not die? The reason he didn't die in my observation and in my view of it is he, he, even though he's not releasing the real him, he's been making efforts towards it. You see, the planets are, not, they're simple. The planets are symbols of shoots coming out of you. It's that simple, just like watching a plant. New shoots come up. They get some sun, they get too much sun, they get too much water, they get not enough water. The shoots just keep coming. We, be, we keep becoming, we keep be growing. And we either assist that process or we stymie it. Or a lot of us do both and confuse it. So in my mind, the reason he didn't die and he came close 
was because he was probably doing just enough to honor this individual that wants out. But the big wreck happened because he doesn't like he doesn't like Tiger. He doesn't he doesn't want to let Tiger out. And my hunch is that he probably has a lot of voices of his dictatorial father in there um, overseeing his mentality. I don't know, but that's how I would look at it. Now, at the same time, he's got Saturn opposite Saturn. And this is leading to my discussion tonight. Okay. When Saturn is opposite Saturn, or Saturn is square Saturn, or Saturn is conjunct Saturn, when Saturn is active in a chart and you have a boo-boo, you're going to have the boo-boo on your kneecap or your teeth. Saturn rules the hard parts. The teeth, all the bones, all the joints, the knees especially, and the skin, because the skin contains the whole body. The reason you have bad things happen when Saturn's there, because Saturn's very famous for good things, great things happening to you when it's there. The reason you have bad things happen to you is because you lack taking responsibility for yourself. If Saturn is anything, it is a planet of taking responsibility. So if you got responsibility on you and you're trying to shove it away and it's coming down on you, Saturn is getting closer and you shove it away and it's getting closer and it's warning you and you shove it away, then you have a Saturnian type of uh, incident. And on the opposite, if you accept the uh, the duty and the responsibility of it, and you accept it, Saturn will hit you and you'll get an award. See, nobody talks about how frequent awards happen when Saturn's right on you. All we hear is about the bad guy. So that's what I want to get into tonight is this type of subject. Let me, let me get a little more detail about that. Let me talk about, I'm going to talk about five of the planets. People come to me and they say, oh, well, Johnny didn't get into school. Well, Fred just got another job. Well, we're going to move to South Carolina. Well, we got a leak in the base. And I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm listening, but I'm really listening what's behind it all. I'm listening to the energy behind it. Because if Pluto's on you, for example, and you are trying to make your life mean more, you're trying to change your life to have more meaning, then out of nowhere, all these people come with money and investments and the door opens for you and you get opportunity to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you're like the opposite. If Pluto is on you and you get these opportunities and you cower from it, because Pluto can't stand cowards. I want my little horse. I don't want my big, don't give me that big third, but I want the little pony. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You're getting a third, but I want the pony. You're getting a third, but and if you keep it up, then Pluto will go a long ways towards getting rid of you. That's what Pluto's job is. Pluto's job is to make sure we're all evolving. And if we're not, it gets rid of us. Somebody, he's the garbage man of the Zodiac. That's his job. So let me give you a good, a good example. And I've told you stories in the past. I told you a story recently about my friend who I warned about Pluto and it put him up against the wall when a car, car came through the roof. A gar, car came through the roof of his building where he worked and pinned him against the wall. And I gave him a three month warning of the day and I was off by one day. The reason the car did what it did is because he's not listening to himself. If you've heard of transactional analysis, simplified, there's an inner child and there's an adult. And that is the prime human being. He has a very healthy, or she has a very healthy child who experiences life. You can't kill this child. This is your life center. Its job is to be awestruck. Wow, look at this. 
become like a child. This adult's job is only, you can go when the light is green, you can stop when the light is red. There's no judgment. But in transactional analysis, these therapists receive all these people that have got 19 different judges up here and 14 different children. The nasty child, the, the, the speak back child, the crybaby child, the critical parent, the, the whiny parent. So we develop all these false identities that impurify us, get us away from just adult and child. What happens is when these planets come through, when these planets come through, when Pluto is coming through and that Pluto shoot is coming through you, you should feel it. You should be talking to your friend and saying things like, boy, you know, I just can't stand this anymore. There's my cat. There he is. See? And I want to do something that has more meaning in my life. Well, if you try, if you pick up on it, that's one thing. Good. If you start to make an effort to try, to listen to it, to take the chance to real good, then good things happen. But what happens so often with us, especially with Pluto, remember, Pluto wants us to be more meaningful. More, uh, more meaningful. And uh, like working with, uh, a lot of times people go and they work with hospice, et cetera. Work as a nurse. The reason these people have accidents is because they don't listen to it. And what happens is, you ain't gonna believe this, but maybe you will, Pluto creates the accident and brings it to you. The part of you, the part of you that is so fed up, I keep sending requests up and she won't let me go do it. I keep saying, I wanna go work with hospice. She won't let me go do it. I wanna go work with cancer people. She won't let me go do it because she's so worried about her money and her taxes and this other job makes money, but it's, it's nothing like who I am. It's nothing like I want. So she won't let me do it. So what the unconscious mind does, the unconscious mind, sends that truck in your lane. And it's decided ahead of time. Is it going to kill you or is it going to just warn you? January 6th, the Capitol building, that was a collective American warning. That was Pluto. That was a collective warning. I gave people a two month notice on that date because of what Pluto was doing. So let me give you another example. You want to do something, you don't do it, then it appears that something from the outside attacks you. For example, when Mars, when Mars comes and hits you and somebody at work jumps in your stuff and it's real nasty and they tell you off. The reason that happens is because you're not owning your own Mars. If you were up until that point where that person jumped on you, if you were saying what you had to say, not being nasty, but saying and asserting yourself, that would have never happened. But since your insides are so frustrated because your insides are not being represented, it will cause somebody in your environment to attack you. Look at Uranus, same thing with Uranus. I see it all the time. I see so many people that want to stay in their job because it's safe. They want to stay in their job because, you know, it's putting the food on the table and they, they think that's everything and it's not everything. To Uranus, is to care less about the food on the table. Uranus believes that when you're being yourself, you're in harmony with the universe and the food will end up on your table, both. So it really has a lot to do with your faith. So in Tiger's situation, what happened was the real him was trying to get through to him. It was trying to say to the captain up on the top, the adult to process it, I would like to go do this and something up there shut it down. And the worst thing you do in astrology, the worst thing shove stuff down. Now, all of you, we'll go time out here. Write this down if you have to. All of you think back to your accidents, when you had car wrecks, when you had big fights, when you had a broken bone, 
when something nasty happened to you, when you got fired, write down the date. You don't have to tell me, go look at, go look at where the planets were. And you're going to see Uranus was hitting Uranus. You're going to see Saturn was hitting Saturn. But what's important, go through your mind what you were doing the day of, the day before, the week before. And I'll guarantee you, if you were going through a phase where you were shoving yourself down, that's what brought about the accident. That's how it works. Because we're all connected. And by God, we all believe in God, but we don't. We all believe in the Bible, but we don't. We all believe in oneness, but we don't. We get so much hypocrisy within our own self. We don't, we don't really realize how connected we are to everything. I had a, I had a job in the computer industry. And I was, it was a narrow field, but I was 20 years. I was an expert in my field nationwide. It was a narrow field, but I was really good at this one field. And I didn't get out because I wanted to go do astrology. And I couldn't get out because I had a young son, growing family and all this. And I kept pushing down the real me, right? I wanted to go do astrology, kept pushing down the real me. So what happened is, poof. My new boss became a guy of 25 years military. Where'd he come from? This guy ain't very friendly. This guy's bad mouthing me. This guy blackballs me. This guy just destroys everything for my computer direction. I could no longer work in the computer field. What was left? Hey, I'll go to Pittsburgh and become an astrologer. It did the work for me. But if I'm dumb, I'm going to think that that boss did it. See, we really love victimology. We really love somebody doing it to us. We love being a victim. Then we're not to blame for anything. But it's all jive. I brought the guy on. I brought him on because I didn't have enough faith in myself, in God, or whatever, to give up what I was doing and go do my astrology. So the guy had to come do the work for me, but it looked like he forced me out. And I couldn't find computer work and I couldn't find computer work and, and on and on and on. And then when I put out my little, my little hat and my little uh, shingle for astrology, boom, 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 boom. All kinds of people, I want a reading, I want a reading, I want a reading. So that's how it works. Now, I don't know what causes the truck to come through your building. I don't know what causes a man to come in the house with a gun. I don't know the dynamics of it. There are a lot of books written about it, but believe me, you're creating it. You are creating it and you're sending it to yourself. And when I get these clients, I tell them none of the, none of the sentences during this interview can start with the word will. I won't entertain a client who wants to start a sentence with the word will. Will I? I don't know. The old days we used to focus on that. Oh, will I get that job while the ruler of the fifth house is over here and the sixth house and the moon is halfway lit up then and Mars is coming? You know, the old type of astrology, that's the way it was until we got Stephen Arroyo and we became much more humanistic. So what we're seeing now is a dynamic world, a dynamic world where this matches that, this matches that. So it's been amazing how I talk to people now and people have gone from zero to 60 in three seconds. I mean, people five, 10 years ago were not able or willing or ready to accept that they're this much of a creator, and now they are. It's just unbelievable how fast this has happened to the collective. I hope you're following me. Yes, Erica. I just saw an interview with Elizabeth Smart today. I hadn't heard anything really about her. 
since she was found. Remember, we were all following when she was kidnapped and then turned up. Right. And it's just amazing, you know, when you think about like, why did this happen to her? And she's talking about what she's gone through since then. You know, she's got little kids. How does she not scare them and yet not lie to them, telling them what happened to her? But she just got sick and tired of having all this focus on her. And even when she was in college, nobody would leave her alone. Elizabeth Smart, Elizabeth Smart. She just couldn't be herself. And she started finding out about all the Native American children and women and people, you know, all sorts of people that had disappeared. And nobody ever did a story on them because she came from a well-to-do well family. Pretty. She pretty so she, but she is now, that is her cause, is to put the focus on all these other people that have been forgotten. That's what her life has changed well, that's, that's, as a result of what she went through. That's really excellent to hear. It's Isn't very, that great? Yes, it is. Now, I want to ask you folks, how many of you believe, as I do, that you're creating your own reality? Raise your hand. Okay. And some people believe it's happening to you. All right. Okay. I understand that. Now, uh, let me tell one quick story, then we'll get on to Liz's chart. Um, thank you, Marsha. Good. Um, in, entailed with all I'm saying, and I know this to be true, and Liza and I study this all the time, wrapped up and entwined with all I'm talking about, I'm telling you, are varying levels of death wishes. Tiger wrecked that car because he had so much of a death wish that was a lot bigger than it was like last week. There's something involved. But how many times do you say, F me? How many times do you say, God, I wish I could get out of this? You know, we just, we just, um, we just, make these unconscious screams that we want to get out of here. And then we're not asking for death to be sliced in half, you know, but we're asking to get out. And we, we don't really realize how many times we're making a death wish. And what I have realized without a doubt, what really matters about a death wish is how much emotions behind it. So if you hear somebody talk about a kind of a death wish, uh, you know, and they're just kind of popping off and you're having a beer, no big deal. But if you hear somebody else talking and there's a lot of passion behind it, then you better watch out. Because they're putting the, putting the uh, gears in motion. Okay, let's get off of that. And let's welcome wonderful Liz from Florida. We don't want to hear about your sunshine. <laughs> Okay, I do have your chart. Thank you. I want to tell you about Liz for a second. Uh, I have announced on this show, if you would like to be one of our guest charts, send your birth detail, including the birth time. I won't do it unless there's a birth time. Your chart with your time, the city of birth, your phone number, your email, send it to me at rick at starself.com, rick at starself.com. And I'll give you a number. This is number five. We've already done number one. And we'll go down those numbers. And you have to be here to be read for. So these people that want to be read for, they have to show up. Uh, it just so happened I knew tonight I would have some extra time. And I'll be dealing with Liz. Um, I'm not going to kid anybody. I didn't pick the do chart to do Liz's chart. Liz didn't pick her chart. Something up there picked it because it's time. I don't even know what's in her chart. I saw one planet earlier, and you're going to start to see this chart come to life. Liz is a cancer. Here is her chart. Let's get this one out of the way. All right. Let's take a look, look at her chart. There's her chart. All right, let's get it on your screen. All right. All right. 
Now, right off the bat, we notice Pluto right at the midheaven, 29 degrees, okay, in Libra. Neptune is rising, 29 and a half, very close to the ascendant, very contrasty, because Neptune's all about the boundless. Saturn or Capricorn's all about the boundaries. So we got some conflict here. We got all about the unruly, um, effusive, heavenly bodies that are not bound by anything next to the sign. It's all about boundaries. What do you got the moon in Capricorn? What do you got the Jupiter rising? Okay, you got Jupiter and the moon at the same degree within 11 minutes of each other. And the moon itself is here. And when the moon is right here, the moon itself becomes critical, secondary, the moon in Capricorn. So she's very lunar and she's a Cancer and she's got Venus in Cancer. She's a Cancer, Sun in Cancer, Venus in Cancer. The moon is very strong, Neptune is strong. So she's very, very, very sensitive. Now I was looking at this earlier for a moment when I spoke with her. What keeps her from being seen as a real softy is she's got Saturn and Mars and Cat Scorpio. This is very strong. This is very powerful. And Pluto's right there. So this gal, this Liz of ours, is a Cancer Scorpio. She's a Cancer Scorpio Capricorn. That's what she is. She's got a very tough Pluto. Saturn and Scorpio can be very tough. In, order, in other words, when, when Liz is angry at herself, I don't want earphones to hear what she's saying. I don't want to hear earphones when she's telling somebody off. I don't want to hear it. Because when she's cut, she's cut deep and she's going to cut back. That's Saturn, Mars, and Scorpio. That can be very strong. And what is this about? This is about don't you betray me. Well, now we're getting into something interesting because what's the real deal with cancers? What's the real deal? I told you many times the last several months. The fear of being abandoned. What's the Scorpio thing? Fear of being betrayed. So if you betray this young lady, you better be ready for some kind of retaliation, is all I'm saying. Now, this Pluto up here is very, very powerful. And I have found when Pluto's way up in the chart like this, it can really, it can really do two different things. You really don't know yet, but it can be really powerful, such as I want to do great things in this world. I want to have a great statement. I want to start a good organization. I really want to go the high road with Pluto. If not, you have to watch the Pluto that's trying to get revenge on somebody. I don't sense that with Liz, so I'm going to push that to the back burner. She got the Mercury and Leo. It's right about the cusp of the eighth house. It's in the seventh house, but it's almost in the eighth. The Mercury and Leo is very, very. Um, talented, it's very into crafts, it's creative, it loves being creative. This, These two planets here, we don't know enough yet, but these two planets here in the seventh house are indicative of somebody who would, who's pretty much a natural at being a counselor of some sort. Okay, so there's counseling ability here, and whenever you see counseling ability together with all the cancer, you would know that it was for children. They have a real natural affinity to help kids. What kind of work do you do, Liz? Um, I own a music studio and I teach music lessons. And what is your specialty um, instrument? Um, piano. Piano, okay. Well, I was married to a piano teacher for 21 years, so I know all about the Listening to that, ding, 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 ding. I, know, <laughs> I know all about that. And you get a lot of children, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, the chart is a nice chart. We have a, a lovely grand trine here, which is very powerful, between very powerful Eris 
and very powerful Uranus and Mercury and Leo. So look at that triangle. A grand trine is very powerful. It's almost always very positive. And it's going on between three fiery planets, Mercury, Eris, Uranus. So I'll tell you what this means, Mercury, Eris, and Uranus. Cancers can be known as being a little timid sometimes. Well, you get a grand fire trying, this woman is not timid. This woman will take the kids outside, light them a bonfire and start clapping. <laughs> She's got fire in her. She's got fire and zest. So this is really, really good. Grand trines are almost always very positive. The only problem with a grand trine, and I think this is true, is the element that it's in fire, the person relies on it so much that they may, in fact, over-rely on it. In other words, you got so much faith that if you need to get up and go, nobody's got to get you going. You just go, let's go, let's go. You got the fire. But sometimes you would benefit by getting a, a second opinion. For example, people with grand trine in air, you know, um, Gemini, Libra Aquarius, they're so confident mentally, they're so confident, they're so strong, it's like a closed circuit. But sometimes they would benefit by getting an, another opinion. So does that make sense about your fieriness? About my, I'm sorry. Your what? fieriness. A fiery? Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you want to get up and do something, you go do it. Yes. Okay, see, it's not the typical cancer who's more tentative. So we see what we're seeing here, we like this because when you got a cancer, you're going to have a delicate little child. That's who they are. It's who they are. But you want other energies around it protected. You saw the tough Scorpio energy, the Pluto with the Saturn and the Mars. Now you got the fire all around it. Okay? So she... She's not just a little flower in the corner. She, if you shake her, she'll, she'll, she'll get you wet too by shaking off the dew. Okay, so let's get down to what's going on. What I see in your chart natally, I like. Now, I'll show you where my questions are and then we'll get down to what's happening. <clears throat> my questions come in here because this is very complex. What does this mean? This means that you really, you had, when you were born, Neptune had just risen above the ascendant. But you couldn't see it because it was daylight. The moon was right behind, here comes Jupiter. These two planets, Jupiter and Neptune, are the two planets of spiritual interest. These are very lovely, powerful, planets within seven degrees here of spiritual dedication, etc. Now, <clears throat> the moon in Capricorn doesn't want to be next to Jupiter. It's not only next to it, it's within the same degree, 11 minutes apart. So the moon doesn't know what to do. The moon wants to be the moon, but the moon in Sag wants to be expressive but the moon of Capricorn wants to be the opposite. So what I think we got here is I think we've got a, a young lady who's a little moody here. And what I would tell people, and most cancers are, what I have had success with cancers and moodiness is this. <clears throat> I think your moodiness is nothing more than your need to explore emotional boundaries. You need to explore here, you need to explore here, you need to explore here. And the worst thing that can happen to you is to get surrounded by people telling you, don't be so moody. And what you got to do with them is go, Nyeh. take a walk, take a walk. If I'm going to be moody, I'm going to be moody. You might call it moody. I don't call it moody. I call it, I got a, a broad, broad emotional outlook. And I really think that that's you. Now, what I want to know, where does this come from? This makes sense. 
This makes sense. This doesn't make sense. Where'd this come from? That's why I look into the past life chart. And I look into what's called the past life transcript. So we're going to take your chart. We're going to do all your harmonics. And we're going to take a look at your 12th harmonic, which is your chart multiplied by 12, put back on the circle. And now we're looking at, and I do a lot of work with this, we're looking at what I call the past life, I'm sorry, the spiritual transcript, the spiritual transcript. This chart is similar to the transcripts that you study with your spirit guide before you take this lifetime. And you say, well, I've been this way and I've been that way and I would like to modify my life coming up and I would like to have these kinds of uh, situations. I'd like to have these new types of trials. What do we see here? Pluto opposite Mars, opposite Neptune. Sun is in Scorpio in the eighth house. Look at this, heavy cancer influence down in the fourth house. Look at this. Once again, the Jupiter moon, the holy, the strong spiritual interest wrapped up with Chiron. This means to me that you've had a lifetime. You had lifetimes where you were very versatile. You'll probably find that in your teaching now. You're very versatile. You want to try this and you want to try this. And you just can't stand getting stuck in a in a, in a narrow groove. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well you, you've got the ability. You've got strong ability. Now, this is really unusual. This is very powerful, opposite Mars. It's Pluto Neptune. This is somebody who has a history of lifetimes where you have been very dedicated to your religion or your philosophy or your spiritual values, whatever it is. You've been really dedicated to it. As a matter of fact, you've been so dedicated that it wouldn't even surprise me with Mars here if you had to fight in the Crusades at some time. You could have been a male. You could have been having to fight for your beliefs. But, but when it comes to you and your spiritual past, there's war involved with Mars, which means you've never been able to have a spiritual belief and people just leave you alone with it. You've had to always uh, at least debate it, okay? The sun is in the eighth house, which means you take your, your uh, spirituality very seriously. The fourth house is very strong. So what are we examining? We're trying to examine why that natal charge has, why does it have Neptune, Moon, Capricorn, Jupiter? What is that saying? We come back to the 12th harmonic and we see, I think I know what we're doing now. It takes a while to translate this. All right. I think what's happening in your chart is this. I think you have had lifetimes where you've had war involved or you've had to defend your city or whatever, but you've always tried to separate the state from the religion. You've always tried to separate my personal spiritual growth with what everybody else thinks as a group. I don't care what they think. I have my own personal relationship with God here that I would like to develop. That's what I see going on in this lifetime of yours now. Now, I'd like for you to respond to that. Does that make sense to you? No. Okay, good. Really? If it doesn't, it doesn't. Good. What, um, how do you feel about spiritual matters? Um, I don't really feel that strongly I, i'm more or less i believe in energy and that's about where it goes there's no okay nothing too deep okay when you think about energy where do you what do you think about where it comes from i don't know where it comes from do you do you believe that that energy is, it is there do you believe it's intelligent 
Um, I guess so, yeah. And it takes care of you? Hopefully. Okay, very good. All right. Well, these things are not simple. Now, before this reading, past couple of months, how have things been going? Um, good, really good. Okay, and you're teaching at what level? Well, I really run the business. I only teach a few now, you know. I started in the school systems, then I broke off and did my own thing and taught everyone. And now I have two studios and I only teach six people. Okay, all um, right. All right, let's see what's going on with you now. Because, um, you know, as I've told other people, the number one business person in the Zodiac, without a doubt, is cancer women. <laughs> cancer women are just really, really good at their work because they they know how to run a business. And I think the reason they um, are so good at it is they make it a family affair. They make it seem like family when people come to them. And, and uh, people love that because they like that feeling of being cared for. Let's go back to the natal chart and see what's going on now. All right. There's the natal. Okay, right now, Pluto is at 24. You've just had Pluto opposite Venus. Right now, your Venus is getting hit really hard right now. Pluto is right here opposite Venus. And Eris is at this point squaring Venus. Okay, now Eris is crossing this line, which is a big deal. Here she is in your whole lifetime. She's only gone from here to there. That's how slow she moves. She's gone from here to there. She's right about there exact now. Now, are you have any thoughts about moving? Uh, yeah. Okay. How about your feelings about the divine feminine on the rise and the whole you know, new respect for the women. It's kind of um, I mean, I, I don't really think about it. I don't really have a... You don't have a strong feeling either way? Not really. Okay. Well, with Eris, with, this can manifest many ways. And this can really trick you up as an astrologer. With Eris on this line, this could have a lot to do with, I'm going to say number one to you, make sure you're here next week to hear Deneen talk because she's going to talk a, a lot about the past lineage, how we're connected to our ancestors. I think you'll find that to be a lot of a lot of good jewels in there for you. Okay, um, if you're not picking up on Eris in terms of the collective changing, what's going on in your family, like your overall family? Uh, my sister's having another baby. My dad is dealing with health issues. That's really about it. And what sign is your dad? Gemini. Okay. What sign is your mother not with us? My mother is, yeah, but she's nothing of note going on with her. <laughs> that okay. What sign is your mom? My mom, I, I, oh, geez, I don't know, October 2nd. Okay, birthday. October 2nd, a Libra. Okay, so you've got Eris going on here in the deep unconscious mind. We don't know what's happening. And the big thing, therefore, that's happening without a doubt is Pluto is hitting your Venus. Okay, Pluto has been at 26 all year, 24, 25, 26, going back and forth in Capricorn, hitting that Venus. Now, the Venus in your chart is two things. It is your artistic sense and it is your romance or your relationships. Now, when your Venus is getting hit, Venus being in Cancer, I didn't ask you, are you married? No. Okay. Pluto hitting Venus, what, it's, what it did to me when it hit me years ago is it takes you deeper. It makes your Venus, unlike a Venus in Cancer, it's changing your Venus to be like a Venus in Scorpio. So you're becoming deeper. You're becoming more passionate. You should notice in your art or in music. Do you do art also? Uh, no. Okay. You're mainly music. Okay. Now, are you, 
are you finding out in your musical taste that you're getting deeper into more intense types of um, composers? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say so. More like Wagner, for example, uh, for your own personal taste, as opposed to um, somebody that's lighter. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm playing more more modern, more dissonant stuff than I used to do yeah. romantic. Yeah, you know, yeah. Classical okay, what Pluto is doing to your Venus, your Venus is always going to be in Cancer. And that means that when you date somebody, you want to be treated like a lady. You want to be treated with respect. And if they don't show you some pretty good uh, P's and Q's in that regard, you don't have much to do with it. You know, they got to show some respect for the fairer sex. That's just how Pluto and how Venus and Cancer is. Now with Pluto hitting, that's going to start to change. You're going to start to become more interested in a grittier, a grittier type of relationship. It's going to, as opposed to a soft one. Does that make any sense to you? Um, maybe. Okay, well, you're a tough one. You're, I know. You're a tough one. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> okay, well, that, what I'm telling you is, is not today and tomorrow is going to go on for at least another year and a half. Don't be surprised if, if relationship wise, you're going to be more interested in uh, mysteries, more of a gritty, I'm not going to say a bad boy kind of relationship, but you're not going to, you're going to take the white gloves off. When you're with a cancer, you you put the white gloves on. When Pluto's hitting them, you take the white gloves off because you don't need them, okay? And what's happening is you're starting to explore a deeper, a deeper sense of your music, of your life, of everything. Any questions? Um, no, I don't think so. I would say it's so the well the Pluto hitting Venus has been for a while or yeah it's been at least a year and a half it's been creeping up okay up. well the I am with somebody and the one before very sweet very soft and the, I didn't like that <laughs> you, you, you just got, you just wanted something else right yeah now was there a time but, long ago when that sweet and soft guy was more to your liking Oh, uh, probably could have been. Okay. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. That's not sure I met them, but. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why it's changing now. And one of the things I'm going to tell you is in the old days, the, the, the cancer versus the Scorpio, in the old days, you really admired somebody who was really favorable towards your family, somebody who was delicate and they um, were sensitive to you. Now you're more interested in somebody who's courageous. Somebody's more ballsy, okay? Because the pendulum swings. That's what happens. And I think that this whole thing going on at your nadir, you're not noticing it yet. And I don't think that's abnormal at all. But I think in time, you're going to start picking up more and more on wanting to join in with the women's movement that's happening because it's really, really strong. And usually the women's movement is very densely populated with cancer personalities. Okay. Now, are you real, real close with your family? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How, how are things with you and your mother? They're pretty good. Okay, because usually cancer people are very, very close with their mother. Let me see what else I can find what's going on. Uh, Susan, I always feel like I'm in Hollywood with that light of yours shining on me. <laughs> I feel like I'm in, you know, drag, drag, and he's giving me an interview. Where was I on August the 8th? Uh, let's see with Liz here. Let's go back to her chart. All right. So we know that Pluto is rather idle, except for its effect on, on Venus. Now we know that a couple of years ago, about three years ago, Pluto was opposite your sun. 
That was a big deal. So that would have been a tremendous um, turning point in the self identity crisis. Did that make sense about three years ago? Uh, so I have to tell you, my, my timeline and memory is not great. So I have trouble figuring out what happened when and if I, which is kind of weird, but true. So I guess that's. So what happened about three years ago? Did you go through a real identity crisis in terms of relationships? Three years ago, I don't think so. Would have been. Okay. No, I don't think so. Well, it feels more I, like now, last year, I have felt more like that. Really? I think so. Let's go back and find out when Pluto hit this chart. Okay. All right. Um, here's your chart. Now we're going to put the flywheel on it. We're going to go backward by years. Yes, it was three to four years ago. You see, Pluto was at 19. Your son was at 19. So when it hits opposite your son, there's a lot of deep change. Now, What happened with your relationship with your family? Has it remained constant or has it changed a lot in the last couple of years? Uh, well, it changed a lot uh, because my dad moved down here from Connecticut. Uh -huh. uh, my sister had her first baby. She's in Georgia. So, I mean, it's changed. Okay. Um, no way. I want to see something else here. Okay, we got Neptune sitting at 20 degrees of Pisces. Neptune is here. Oh, the one thing I can tell you when we're gonna look forward now, what I can tell you with a surety by talking so much to you, things are gonna get milder for you. They're gonna get milder. Now you may get more intense because the collective is changing. The collective, everybody's going through the heavy stuff of, of Pluto and Eris. But in your chart, you've got an indication that when things get heavy, they don't get too heavy. And I think one of the reasons that you don't get too heavy, like other people would, is you got that Jupiter on your moon. And I think that's really nice. When Jupiter's on your moon, you have a tendency, moon people have a tendency to be morose or they can be wallowing. Oh, things are so bad for me. But with your Jupiter there, no, that doesn't happen. You have a, a, a rather easy ability to shake things off. Just water rolling off your back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's not Cancerian. That's very rare. That's why I've had to work with you. The Jupiter in you is having a much bigger impact than we know. And that just goes to show during a reading, you can be fooled by this or that. But we go back to that strong Jupiter at the ascendant on the moon, same degree. You, if you ever read about astrology and you read about your moon in Capricorn, also read about moon in Sagittarius. Because your Jupiter being there makes your moon act very much like a moon in Sag. And moon in Sag people, I have found moon in Sag are the very best cancers out there. Because cancers can really get down in the dumps. They can feel sorry for themselves. But the moon in Sag cancers, I know, they stay rather buoyant. They stay rather upbeat. They have a natural buoyancy. And you also, I think, completely take for granted that Pluto at the top of your chart. You're a lot more powerful than you might think. I don't know how powerful you think you are, but, but cancers usually grow up with an excessive need of dependency on the family. And as they grow older, that dependency becomes less. Well, I think yours is gonna go much faster than most cancers. You'll still love the family all you want, but I don't think you're as dependent on the family as some cancers are because you've got that grand trine in fire. You got Pluto at the top. You got Saturn at the top. 
this tells me that you're pretty ambitious. I would say so. What what uh, what are your plans to do with a musical career, with teaching? Well, I mean, I already, I already opened a business, a very successful studio, uh, multiple studios, multiple teachers that I run. I'm thinking maybe I'll open more, or I may buy other businesses. And well, your your charge a go for that. It's a go for that. I really like the balances in your chart. You've got the sensitivity, so you're not going to run over anybody. You've got the ambition with that Pluto, Mars, and all that Capricorn. You got the ambition, but you've got the love for the family. I mean, it, it's really pretty well balanced. And I'm really surprised comparing you to hundreds of cancers I've talked to. You're much more um fiery, uh, able to be out in public and not be unnerved by it. Oh, no. I like that. <laughs> well, you just have it. You, know. you, you have a really nice balance. So I'm real grateful to see your chart and, and learn from it. And uh, what about anybody else? What did you see in her chart? Linda, anybody? Can you put it back up, Rick, so we can look yeah, at I it? Yeah, I sure would. There it is. I tell you what I'll do. What, what, one one second here. One second, please. Before we do this, I think what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and say good night and thank you to our um, YouTubers. And we'll continue in a minute. But remember, join us next week, next Thursday night for Deneen Joiner, seventh generation of shamans and she's really a good one okay uh good night to the youtubers from us unpluggers <laughs>